as he comes up. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, God is so good. God is so good. You feel that, everybody? You feel, you feel what's happening here? You know, I don't want to ever miss a blessing, and uh, we, we want to give $1,000 towards your uh, renovation also. Praise God. I, 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 can't, I can't pass a blessing up like that because I know that, you know, I've been a part of a lot of building projects and things, and, and you know, it's a matter of just starting. And, and I always tell my people, I remember we, we paved our parking lot, $356,000, and we, we paid cash. We didn't borrow a dime of it. And I remember when we started, started the project we didn't have any money and 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 I had a few people around me saying we can't start we can't start we can't start and I said well we can't finish unless we start we can't finish you the only way you can finish something is to start it and, and I said, you know, we had raised like $5,000. I said, let's start with $5,000. I said, we need an underground pipe. Let's buy it. So we bought it, and that cracked it open right there. It began to grow, and, and it took us two years. It took us two years. We raised all $356,000, paid for it cash, and, and, and did it. But we did it because we started. Amen? God's going to make it happen. Give the Lord one more big hand of praise, everybody. <clears throat> Hey, if you don't mind, I'm going to sing at the end. I'm, I'm want because I want to try to get this in tonight, and and if I if I have time at the end, I'm going to sing. But I, you know, how many know if you win the win the man, you win the family. Amen. If you win the man, you win the family. And and so you you got to time for some. You know, I I grew up with a a mother that went to church and brought us to church. But most of my life, most of my life, I watched I watched us get in the car, get cleaned up, get our church clothes on, get loaded up in the car. And wave at my dad as we as we all left for church, and we left him there, and and we grew up, and he just just wasn't interested, and and all. And when I when I became a pastor, I remember my mother raised us in a Baptist church, and when I became a pastor, or when when I got born again, I got born again under a real good word pastor there in Panama City, and uh, I came into him one Wednesday night. I said, "Look, I, I I really feel a call to preach." He said, "I know you've got a call to preach, and you're preaching Wednesday night," and uh, and. I, and I'm, I was shocked. I didn't know what to do. So, so I, I, you know, of course, I wanted my parents to be a part of it. So I, I went and told my parents. I said, I, I want you to be a part of this and come to it. But I was a little bit afraid because this was an Assembly of God church, and I knew they were going to be raising their hands, and they might be jumping, and they might be shouting. And I, and I didn't know how my dad would be about that. I thought he'd be real negative and wouldn't have nothing, to, you know, didn't want nothing to do with it. And uh, so I told him. I began to try to sheepishly try to explain, you know, you might see some people do this and they might jump. Sometimes they run. I don't know what they're going to do. And, and he says, he said, son, do you think I've never been to church? And I said, well, you've never been when I've seen you. I've never seen you go. And he said, he said, your, your grandmother was this redheaded Pentecostal woman that used to drag us to brush harvest. Now, I'm, I'm, at that time, I'm 17 years old, newly born again, fixing to start the ministry, and I'd never in my life heard my dad say something about going to a spirit-filled church. And he said, I can handle it. He said, let's go. Let's go. When we built our new building, the first little old man that come down the altar and give his life to the Lord was my father, and he's been serving the Lord ever since. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But I believe that men go through seasons, and there's one person in the Bible that you see almost his entire life. You see him from a little boy all the way up to the day he dies, and that, that is David. You, you see him progress. You see him mature, and that's what this message is about. It's about maturity because men go through seasons. Men go through seasons, and I, and I put together a little teaching. Usually, I do, we do a lot of men's conferences on the five seasons of David. And there's five really distinct seasons that men go through. The shepherding season, the champion season, the king season, the killer season, and the fathering season. And you can recognize uh, these men going through this. You, every one of you has a man in your life somewhere, a father, a son, an uncle, a brother, people that you work with. And sometimes you just shake your head and say, man, what's this guy thinking? Why, why is he doing that? What's, what's, what's he 
got on his mind? What would make him do something that crazy? What would make him do something that out of character? And you, you don't know that these, these men are going through changes. And so sometimes the, the women like this message more than the men because they walk out of here with a little bit of understanding because they thought the guy just went crazy. But but now they, I, I, I see exactly what he's going through now, Pastor. I know what exactly is. You can recognize and survive these seasons, and you can live in peace knowing that this doesn't last forever. It's just something he's going through, and i got to help him get through it. And, and you can understand the way men go through things like seasons. You tell people all the time, you know, seasons, they don't stay. they just something they, they go and pass. It's not winter forever, amen? It's not summer forever. You know, how many know it, it sure is hot in the summertime because you got the humidity just like we do in Panama City. feels like a jungle. feels like you're in a sauna. Yet you get in the shade, doesn't help you a bit. It's just hot. And, and you can complain about winter or you can find you some flip-flops and some short britches and, and a fan and a, and, and a little bit of coolness and just say this will pass. This will go through it. So seasons can change and they change and they can either be enjoyed and embraced or they can be endured. But you can't skip them. You can't, you can't say, I decided not to have winter this year. I decided it's not going to be hot this year. It's not up to you. It's just something you're going through. And so when summer comes, you can either you can either wear a coat and be miserable, or you can find some air conditioning and say, this is just where we're at. Amen? And when winter comes, you can complain, or you can build a fire and say, this is just where we're at, and God's going to get us through it. Amen? I, I said that about the, uh, about the uh, uh, economy and the inflation. You know, we can complain about it. We can complain. We can jump in with everyone else and say the gas is high, bread is high, you know, milk is high. We can talk about it all the time, or we can say it is what it is. God's going to take care of me no matter what. Amen. How many believe God's going to take care of you no matter what? Amen. And so we, we see these things, and so some men in your life are even going through menopause is what I call it. Uh, Manipals, where they're just going through this crazy time with them in this. So I'm going to start right here, 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 17. And I, I got to teach a little bit to get us on the same page. So 1 Samuel 17, 17, Jesus said unto David his son, Take now for thy brethren uh, uh, an ephod of perch corn and these ten loaves and run them to the camp to thy brethren and carry these ten cheeses to the captain of their thousand. And look how your brothers fare and, and, and take their pledge. You know, get get some some news from them. Find out how it's going. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting the Philistines. And David rose up early in the morning, left the sheep with a keeper. How many know you can't just run off and leave them? He had to take care of his business. Left the sheep with a keeper, took and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the trench as the host was going forth in the fight and shouted for the battle. Now, now there is a time in a man's life where he goes through the shepherding season. You know, David in this scripture, he's not a king. He's not famous. He's not a giant killer. He's a nobody. He's a, he's a shepherd. He's, a, he's the one that's running errands. He, he's, he's not called to lead anybody. He's called to run some errands. Take your brothers some lunch. Take, your, take their, boss, their, their boss captain some cheese. And so there's a season of apprenticeship that every man goes through. How many men know what I'm talking about? Every man goes through that time where you're the low man on the totem pole, where you're the one has got to go get everything. You're the one that, that when they find a dirty job, you're the one it's handed to. Come on, somebody. How many have ever been there? And, and you see, you don't start at the top. How many of you men know you don't start at the top? You start at the bottom. So the shepherding season is about the apprenticeship in manhood. And every man has a season of discipleship so they can become what God has designed them to be. It's a season of learning. It's a season of of breaking. It's a season of, of education. It's, it's a discipleship season. The shepherd season is the hardest season for the man because if you don't learn to follow, then you'll never be qualified to lead. Amen? Oh, I love when young men hear this message because for some reason we've got a generation of people that think you start at the top and go from there. But how many know I don't care who you are or where you are, you're going to start at the bottom. Amen? And it's going to be lonely at the bottom. It's going to be dirty 
at the bottom. It's going to be hard at the bottom. It's going to be inconvenient at the bottom. But the only way you learn how to go all the way through, uh, Brandy's late uh, father, stepfather, was a builder. He sat down and told me one time he'd built over 7,000 homes in his lifetime. And I said, how'd you start? He said, I started working for a plumber, and then I worked for an electrician, and then I worked for the framing crew, and then I worked for the roofers, and then I learned how to do drywall, and then they had me laying brick. And he said, I learned every phase of building that house. And then one day I said, you know, I think I'm going to be the contractor. And, and he said, but, but he only knew how to be a good contractor because he knew how to be a good plumber and a good electrician and a good drywaller and a good roofer. How many know you got to learn it all if you're going to do it all? Amen. And, and so see, the reason that you have to understand this is because if you don't learn to follow, then you're never qualified to lead. You know, there's a season why you have to lay down your net and follow someone else. Amen. When, when Jesus told uh, Peter and James, he said, lay down your net and follow me. Let, let's do it like this in more modern terms. Stop your pursuits and join me in my pursuits. Stop what you're doing and help me with what I'm doing. Well, a lot of people, that'd be offensive to them. Because because if you tell someone, stop what you're doing, immediately you'd bow up and say, what what do you mean? Is what I'm doing not important? How, how many know? How many know what you're doing is important, but if you ever want to learn to do it better, you better hang out with a bridge builder a little while. Amen? You better hang out with a builder a little while. See, all men want to be the top dog. They want to be the chief. They want to be the boss. But unless you have a season as shepherd, see, see when you tell someone to come out of the field, run this bridge bread and this cheese to your older brothers, you may think that you're using them or belittling them, but what you're actually doing is teaching them how to be a king one day. Amen? How many know to learn how to be a king one day, you've got to be a shepherd for a season? Give the Lord praise if you believe it. You've got to be a shepherd for a season. If you don't fulfill your season of taking care of another man's sheep, you'll never be qualified to have your own flock. All these preachers in here, raise your hands again, preachers. I guarantee you they've set up a lot of chairs in their day. Amen? They've set up a lot of tables in their day. <laughs> they vacuumed a lot of church sanctuaries in their day. Come on, somebody. They've, they, they've, done, they've done a lot of you get this, you get that. They've carried a lot of Bibles up to the pulpit for other men in their day. Amen? And, and they did it because not because that someone was using them, but because someone was building them. Amen? How many know what I'm talking about? Somebody was building them. Matthew 25 and 23 says, The Lord said unto him, Well done, you good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over the few things. Now I'll make you a ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. See, you need time to work under people. You need time to be built under people. And, and this is the time in the trenches. This is the time when, when you begin to understand the cost of production. You understand how it's built. You you, you got, listen, if you're going to be the contractor, you've got to, you've got to learn the steps of things. You First you put in the plumbing, then you put in the electro, electrical. You got to have a wall to put that in. You got to frame it first. You got to have a foundation to put that on. You, you got to have some. You got to have the, the dirt work done before they form up the foundation. You've got to know how to build by doing these things. But the man that has dug ditches, the man that has run errands, the man that's been the gopher, played the second fiddle, he learns the true cost of production. And then one day he gets up and he can do those things things because, you know, sometimes we do a disservice to church people because they have talent. Sometimes the church messes people up from God building because they have talent. And if we're not careful, if we're not careful, we, we, we promote people that are successful in the world, but just because you're successful in the world doesn't mean you're successful in the church. Amen? Uh, so, so you've got to be careful because if, if, you're, if you're good at something in the world doesn't mean that you've been shepherding in the church. Amen? Amen. And so you got to be careful with that. Moses was a prince of Egypt, and, and he was an important man in Egypt. But when he met Jethro, Jethro didn't care a thing about that. Jethro said, I want you to go take care of the sheep on the backside of the desert. So in other words, he told Moses to do what all the other shepherds were doing. Now, Moses could have got offended. He could have said, I'm too big for this. Don't you know who I am? Don't you know how important I am? But because he was spiritual enough, 
enough to recognize there was a difference between a Pharaoh and a father. Amen. And he recognized Jethro as a father. And he said, you know what? I'm going to do what this man says. And instead of being less, I'm going to be more because I'm going to let him build me. Amen. How many of you men are ready for God to build you into what he wants you to be? Amen. But, you, but you've got to take this season and let God do it. You see, if you skip your opportunity to be faithful over the little things, you've disqualified yourself to be ruler over much. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you were the MVP of the Dallas Cowboys. It doesn't matter what you did in the world. When you come to the church, you got to get in line with everybody else, and you've got to let God build you from the ground up. Amen? You know, the church, we don't promote, we don't promote talent. We promote faithfulness in the church. Come on, somebody. I said in God's house, we don't promote talent. We promote faithfulness. And that's powerful. You see, if we do that right, then we give people a good foundation. Give good people a foundation. And that helps them for the next season in a man's life. And like I said, I'm going to condense this just a little bit. The next season is the champion season in the man's life. Now, you're going to like this one. This is the good one. Uh, 1 Samuel 17 and verse 50 says, David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone, and he smote the Philistine and slew him, and there was no sword in David's hand. And therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took out his sword, Goliath's sword, and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head, and the Philistines saw their champion was dead, and they fled. Amen? Uh, Let me tell you how this goes for all of you boxing fans. Uh, If you knock out the champ... You are the champ, amen? Uh, If you knock out their champion, you are the champion. If you kill the champion, it means you become the champion. Every man gets to be a champion for a season in their life, amen? There is a real short season in a man's life where he can do nothing wrong, amen? It's a really short season. There's a short season in a man's life when he can do nothing wrong uh, because it's the season, it's the season where you're on top. I mean, I mean, everybody is cheering your name. You know, I heard a joke one time said, if a man makes a decision in the woods and his wife is not there to hear it, is he still wrong? (laughs) David killed the champion of the Philistines. So guess what? I, I killed him, then I'm the number one guy. David is the man. He's the rock star. He's the hero. He's the quarterback. He's the he's the the win and run. David is the champion of the world in that moment. And that's uh, 1 Samuel 18 and 6 says it came to pass that when David returned from the slaughter of the Philistine that the women all came out of the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tabrets and joy and with instruments of music. And the women answered one another as they played, and they said, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. And Saul became angry, and the saying displeased him. And and he said, you know, they've ascribed David for ten thousands, and they've ascribed me for killing thousands. What more can he have but the kingdom? And so so Saul is noticing that David has just become the most famous man in the city in one afternoon. If you remember, remember with me, he was there to take bread and cheese to his brothers. He was there running an errand. How many know the errand you skip for God, you may mess up your destiny, amen? You got to go where God sends you, amen? You got to do what God's telling you to do. Pastor, if you weren't willing to be humble enough to cut hair because you got to keep the church alive, because you got to keep the door open, if you had not been there cutting hair, you might have missed the most important meeting of your life. Amen. How many know if I don't take this bread and cheese, I may miss the most important meeting of my life. Um, I had a young man in our church one time. He come to me, this true story come to me, and he was frustrated. He was young. You could tell he was frustrated. And I said, what's wrong with you? I said, why are you all down? You're all, all upset all the time. He said, I'm working a job, pastor. And he said, I work with the, I work with the owner's son. And he said, I do everything at that business. I take care of everything. I handle everything. I take care of all of our customers. And he said, this guy gets all the credit. He said, I never get acknowledged for anything. Raise comes, this guy gets it. Uh, uh, You know, uh, recognition comes, this guy gets it. Awards come, this guy gets it. And he doesn't do it, I do it. And he says, you know what I want to do? I just want to stop trying at all. I I want to just sit there and do nothing. I said, whatever you do, don't do that. 
I said, how many know God doesn't ever want you to do a bad job? Can I get an amen? I said, whatever you do, don't do that. It wasn't but a few months passed by, and he come to me. He was so happy. I said, what's going on? He said, I got a new job. I said, how'd you get a new job? He said, our competitor kept coming into our business. And he, he took me to the side, and he said, every time I come in here, you're the person that's handling everything. You're the person that's taking care of everything. He said, I want you to come do this for my company. I'm going to pay you three times what you're making here. <laughs> Hallelujah. But how many know what would have happened had he come in for the interview that he didn't know he was in, that he didn't know he was ha What would have happened had he come in and the guy was just sitting there in a chair and wouldn't help him and wouldn't do the job? How many know you never know who's watching you? Amen. You better take that bread and cheese. Amen. So, so David becomes the champion. Th think about this. David rides into town and the women begin to cheer for him. He's like Elvis. He's like, he's like Brad Pitt. I mean, they're, they're clawing at him. They're, they're screaming. And they're talking about he is a rock star in this moment. And women are fainting and swooning in his presence. And after all, Saul, Saul, you know, Saul's old news, there's a new star in the sky, and it's David. And everybody's watching David. Surviving the champion se season in your life is about how you handle fame. H have you ever heard the thing about you want to be a, a good loser and an even better winner? How you handle fame is about how you take on the champion season in your life. The, the fame is defined as widespread reputation, especially of favorable character. We all experience fame in our life. And I, I, want, you to, I want you to understand this, men. I want you to get this in your, your spirit tonight. And I want you to think about this, ladies, with all the men in your life, all those sons in your life, all those uh, brothers in your life, and your father and all the people. There was a time in their life where everything was right and they felt strong and they felt powerful. It was their champion season and everything was right. And, and you've got to remember that fame is not just for movie stars and singers. These men, every man in here has had a season in their life where they was on top. And I mean, they was killing it. I mean, they were, it was happening. I mean, it, it was, it, they was killing the giant. I mean, it was, it was happening in their life. They felt like king of the world. And, and you got to remember, every champion has an ascent and a descent because you don't stay champion forever. Amen? And, and bear with me on this because there's always a time what goes up must come down. Can I, can I get an Amen. And so you won't stay champion forever. I respected T.D. Jakes. Uh, years ago, I was at a pastor's conference, and he said, you know, he said, everything I touch right now turns to gold. Everything I write is a bestseller. Everything I do goes straight to the top. And he said, I, I would be foolish if I thought it would always be this way. He said, because it won't. It won't. He said, there'll, there'll be a younger, more exciting preacher come along. He'll be preaching some of the same stuff I did and some of the same stuff you did. But for some reason, everybody Everybody thinks he's the greatest thing now. And he said, I'll have to sit there and I'll have to say, I preached that. I said that. I did that. But it won't mean anything because it's just not my moment and it's his. Amen. And, and so you begin to understand what you do with fame, what you do with fame, how you handle the big successes and the big failures in your life define who you really are. It shows people who you really are. Listen, every day you don't turn water into wine. Every day you don't multiply the the bread and fishes. One afternoon you die on the cross, but how you handle that cross is just as important as how you handle that bread and fish. Amen. How you handle the top is just as important. Jesus had multitudes of people thronging him, but he had to remain touchable. Listen to me. He had to remain touchable. Don't get so high. Don't get so built up. Don't, don't get so high that people are not able to reach the hem of your garment. Amen? How you handle fame, how you handle success is really, really important. When you're sitting there and everybody's cheering your name and you look back at the boss man and he's thinking, man, they just, they, they just about insulted me with that little song they made up. David has killed his 10,000s. I've killed a 1,000. He said, what's that mean? See, something began to build because when you're famous, when you're famous, you start, you start some pressure that you're not really used to. You're not always under. It's good to be cheered. Everybody likes applause. Can I get amen? Uh, at, at, at 80, someone asked Bob Hope why he didn't retire and go fishing, and he said, because fish don't clap. That's why I don't retire. 
The fish don't clap. You know, there, there's a part. Dave, David has the world at his feet, uh, but he, he managed to keep his head out of the clouds. He handled his fame correctly. There's nothing wrong with enjoying your season of being famous as long as you know that the season doesn't last forever. How many know every Mike Tyson has a Buster Douglas scheduled somewhere in their life? Uh, you may have never tasted the canvas before, but it's coming. Amen. Uh, you, you, you may, you know, er, every Brett Favre that's superstar quarterback has an Aaron Rodgers that'll walk up one day and take your job and I don't care how many Super Bowls you want and how many how famous you are they'll say you're old he's young we're going with him and, and there's there's nothing you can do about it because time is passing you by and, and so you've got to you've got to understand that the only way to stay famous is to die famous and I don't want to die amen I, I want to move on to the next season come on somebody say amen and if you keep living fame passes you and you become ordinary again. I, I want to say that again. I said ordinary is coming. Amen. No matter how high you are, no matter how big it is, no matter how things are going, ordinary is coming. But ordinary is okay if you know that's where God has you at the moment. Amen. How many know I want to be in perfect step with God? I want to be in the perfect will of God wherever I am in my life. I want to hear the voice and I want to do what he wants me to do. Give the Lord praise if you believe it. I want to do what he wants me to do. So 2 Samuel chapter 14, 2 Samuel 14, right now David's famous, but he starts getting old. His battles become yesterday's news, and there's always a new, younger version of you coming out. 2 Samuel 14, 25, and it says, Now in all of Israel, there was no one who was praised as much as Absalom. What? As Absalom for his good looks. From the sole of his foot to the crown of his head, there was not a blemish on him. <laughs> Verse 26 says, I'm in 2 Samuel 14, 26, when they cut the hair of his head at the end of every year, he cut it because it was heavy on him. My hair's too heavy. His hair was heavy on him when they cut it, and they weighed the hair of his head, and it was 200 shekels according to the king's standard. Absalom is David's son, and he's so pretty. He's so pretty that he's famous for his hair. How many know things is changing? He didn't even kill a giant. You mean they're, now they've changed the song to Absalom is the one famous? Absalom didn't even have to do what I had to do. He didn't have to pay what I had to pay. He didn't have to go through what I go, go through. This guy's famous because his hair looks good. I'm a giant killer, and this guy's getting cheered because he's pretty? How many know there's some rude awakenings in our life, isn't there? Amen. Amen. See, m the most important thing to remember about fame is it's fleeting. It passes quickly and it blows away like dust. He's so pretty that his haircuts are famous. And most of the most important thing to remember in your season of fame is not to abuse your season as champion. Treat people with respect while you're at the top. Can I get an amen? When you're at the top, treat people with respect. I like the, the meme that I saw that said I, I always respected my father because he, te he, he treated the janitor the same as the CEO. He didn't respect, disrespect anybody. How many know men, when you're on top, God expects you to respect everybody. God expects you to treat everybody with honor. Treat everybody with honor. I did a huge funeral a, a few months ago, and they had it at another man's church because my church is still destroyed. We haven't rebuilt it yet. And we had it at another man's church. And they're all talking about, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, we're going to do this. And I said, I need to talk to the pastor. Uh, Y'all are using his building and all. And they said, well, it's all right. We don't matter. We talk to this. I said, no. I said, I'm not preaching until I talk to the pastor. I said, I'm not walking in that man's pulpit until I've paid him the right honor and respected him and asked him, I don't care what y'all have planned. If you want me to preach it, I've got to talk to him. So I called him, and he, and he said, oh, Pastor John, don't worry about it. He said, I said, no. I said, uh, you know, number one, I want, you to, I want you to open with prayer and say whatever you want to say because it's your house, and I'm not speaking at your house and, and let, let you speak at it. And he told me, well, that's going to be a problem because I'm going to be out of town. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to even open with prayer. But then he said to me, he said, you know, he said, it means, he said we have, we're the largest sanctuary in town, so everybody uses our building for all these big events. He said, you're one of the first people that's ever called me about it. For, and, and I thought to myself, I'm, I'm not going to do anything in your house without honoring you. 
When we used to be gospel music singers years ago, we used to go into these other churches, and, and we would always ask, you know, can I move the pulpit over? Can I? You don't go into people's house and start moving furniture around. I, I didn't walk in here on Sunday and say, you know, this is too high for me. I want to put this down there. Did, did you notice I never corrected the sound man? I mean, I mean, I mean, sometimes I like a little more monitor because I don't hear that well. But I don't, I, don't, I don't correct the sound man when I'm at your house. I just sing. I figure he knows how you like it better than I do. I just sing. If you can hear me, you can hear me. If you can't, you can't. But he knows what this house needs better than I do. So I just sing. I, I just sing. And he'll adjust it and do all the buttons and all this and that because I've learned that I need to respect the house that I'm in. Come on, somebody. I need to respect the house. Give, give the Lord praise if you believe it. <clears throat> Shepherding season's about discipleship. It's about it's about. Uh, grow apprenticeship. The champion season is about how you handle fame. The next season a man goes into is the king's season, and it's the season of respect. Second Se- Samuel chapter 23, verse 15 says, David longed and said, Oh, that one would give me a drink of water of the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. And the three mighty men break through the host of the Philistines. They drew the water out of the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate. They took it and they brought it to David. Nevertheless, David wouldn't drink thereof, and he poured it out unto the Lord. And he said, Be it far from me, O Lord, that I should do this. Isn't this just the same as the blood of the men that went in jeopardy of their lives? Isn't this the same as the blood of my men? I'm not going to drink this. These things did the three mighty men. David had spent his time in school. He had repeatedly proven himself in battle. And now he was finally entering into a time where he was enjoying respect of all those around him. After you've been champion for a while, you'll find that the challenges become less frequent. You'll find that they go away completely. People stop challenging you. When I was a young pastor, I was like a rattlesnake. I started started my church when I was 23 years old. 23 years old, I started my church. And I was like a rattlesnake. If you question me, I'd bite your head off. Because I was so used to these older guys challenging me on every decision I made. And, and, and then, then God began to beat me up about that. He said, man, you're not going to have anybody left. Uh, because because you, you, you don't let anybody tell you anything because you're so afraid that they're speaking down to you. You're so afraid. They're, they're, and, and, and after a while, they saw I made good decisions. They saw my heart was for the church. They saw that I wasn't a hireling. They saw my heart was there. They, I stopped being challenged. And I moved into this new season where no one was challenging me. I, 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 was, I was the man at the church, and, and I felt respected. David had come to this place where he had respect all around him. After you've been champion for a while, you'll find the challenges go away, that people stop challenging you. They believe you really do know what you're doing. You really can kill the giant. You really do have a vision. And, and they stop challenging you, and then all of a sudden the people simply recognize you as the king of your domain. You're, you're the king of this area. You're the king of that zip code. You're, you're the one. You're, you're the one that God's going to use in that place. And just like the champion, there are kings in all walks of life. Every vocation has a position of the king. I remember we had this little tire store around the corner from the church. It's called Doc's Tire. Still there. Been, been in business over 40 years. And, and old Doc, old Julius Smith was his name. Everybody called him Doc. Old Doc, he knew everything there was about tires. But if you went there, if you went there, it was this old, greasy-looking place with old a roof ha- lopsided half on. There was a bunch of feral cats running around. A, a, bunch, a rooster would come by while you're sitting there. There was no big screen and, and cappuccino machine and leather couch for you to sit on. You just stood there while they're while they changing your tire and fixing your tire. But while you were there, people pull up with their Mercedes. People pull up with their BMWs, all the log trucks, all the, the UPS truck, the the FedEx truck, they'd all be crammed in there trying to, why? Because everybody in town knew if you wanted your tires right, you go to Doc's and Doc's will fix them right. He'd give you a good price. You never have to come back and check anything because he was the king of tires. And everybody knew he was. Every man in here has been in a season in their life where they were the king of something, where they knew what they were doing. How many worked a job for over 20 years? Raise your hand. How many worked a job for over 30 years? How many worked a job for over 50 years or 40 years? 
Look at some of these men back here. Ain't nobody going to walk up and tell them what they're doing. They know what they're doing. Come on. Come on, somebody. Ain't nobody going to tell them, well, there's a better way to do that. No, they don't need a better way. They've done it some, They've done it every way you can think of. See, just like the champion, there's kings in all walks of life, every vocation. There's pastors that are kings because they've helped every church. They've built every church. They've encouraged every young pastor. They've built up everyone around them, and they're just, they're just respected. I, I think of your pastor that way, Pastor Jerry Hovader. He's respected. He's respected because they know he's been through it. Man, this guy been through the fire. He's, he's walked the wall. He's carried the cross. He's, he's done the work. He's paid his dues, and people respect him. Come on, somebody. They respect him. He's a king. And how many know every man should be a king in his own home? Every man should be the king in his own home. Man, you got to really watch this. And, and let me tell you something, family. You got to watch the respect of mom and dad. They got to have respect. Can I get an amen? Listen, you can't keep calling him stupid. You can't keep saying he doesn't know what he's doing. You can't keep saying he's always failing because you're saying that in front of little kids. And one day when they get about 16, 17 years old, you're going to need a king in the house to step up to the front of the door and say, we ain't going to do it in here. We ain't going to have it in here. But if you reach over to them, and when you need that strong man, you need that voice in your house, you need that lion to come out and straighten things out, it ain't going to work if they've been listening to you for 17 years, so call him stupid, and call him lazy, and call him no good. You're going to need that man to be a king in your home for your cubs. Amen? How many know we ought to build up the men in our life and let them be a king in our home? That, go, that goes for the women, too. You, you can't call her lazy. You can't call her stupid. You can't call her names. Then expect her to raise strong children. you got to respect one another. How many know what I'm talking about? you got to respect one another. Without a king, you, the gates of your home are open for attack. Because anybody hearing me? Without a king, the gates of your home are open for attack. The king has paid his dues. He's worked jobs he didn't like for people he didn't like. He's fought battles he didn't know he would come back from. He's been through difficulties, and he's not a king by chance. He's a king because, because, you know, kings are not made of luck. They're made of time and tribulation. They've been through something. They've paid the price. Kings carry tremendous responsibilities. And now here's what I want to say to you men that are in the king season of your life. You're respected. You're respected in your field. You're respected in your home. And with that respect comes responsibility. You can't just say just anything. Other people can. Other people can be flippant about things and say whatever they want to. But a king has to measure his words. Amen. A king can't just say, I wish I had a drink by the well, because it'll cost him something. People that love him and respect him will do anything he says, so he has to watch what he says. How many know when you become to a place of respect and you've moved into the king position, you have to begin to say, What I say matters, so I got to watch what I say. Amen. A, a lot of you uh, people, I've seen grown men and grown women that, that are struggling with things. They're struggling with words. That I've seen grown men and grown women that, that fight depression and anxiety and go through all kind of problems because of something a king said in their life, and they've never been able to forget it. They've never been able to get it out of their mind because someone they respected said something that took them the wrong direction. How many know someone at school can call you fat or call you ugly? It doesn't bother you at all. But if the king says it, it'll stay with you for years and years and years. And listen, men, when you become the king, when you get the respect that God has given you, when you come to the place that God puts you in a position of respect, you've got to measure your words and you've got to make your words count for the good of those that are seated under under you. God wants you to say the right things. Give the Lord praise if you believe it. God wants you to. Here, here's, what you've, here's what you've got to remember about this whole thing. If you want people to be subject to you, men love this scripture that says wives be subject to their husbands like Christ is to the church. Men love that scripture, don't they? It's the only scripture some of us know. We've memorized. That's a great scripture. Wives be subject to your wife. Have you ever looked up what the word subject means? The word subject means come on, to come under your protection and your provision. 
If you want your family to be subject to you, what you're saying is, I will protect them and I will provide for them. How many know it's on you? How many grew up with a daddy that worked all the time? I grew up with a daddy that worked all the time. My dad, my dad saw combat in, in Vietnam and Korea, saw combat in both wars. My, my, I have stories, I don't remember them because I was too little, but I have stories of my dad working at the Air Force Base till four o'clock when they were stationed in Minot, North Dakota. And then he would go and pump gas till nine o'clock because he was an enlisted man. He had little families trying to care of everything. Listen, when a man has to do it, he'll go cut hair because he got to take care of the people in his house. How many know what I'm talking about? What, what, if a man's got to work two jobs, he'll work two jobs. If a, if a man's got to take on extra projects, he'll take on extra projects because there are people that are subject to him. With the respect comes responsibility. Come on, say amen. With the, you want the respect, you've got to take the responsibility. And that means I've got to take care of whatever they need, whatever they need. I, I'm going to make it happen. I, I'm going to protect you, and I'm going to provide for you because you're subject to me. Your words have weight, and you've got to remember that. You know, when we had a prison ministry, 98%, this is a, a fact, 98% of the men in prison did not know a father when they were growing up, and they were repeatedly told one day this guy's going to end up in prison. Prison. I've seen people say it to little kids. Man, you're going to wind up in jail, little boy. You, the way you act, you're going to wind up in prison. They're told that over and over and over again. The wrong person tell them that, it'll make it happen because those words have weight and they have power. And when, Listen, what, God wants your words to have weight. God wants your words to have power, but he wants them used correctly. Can I get an amen? Amen. I, I got to get through this. I don't, I don't want to be too late. So, so we go to the fourth season. The fourth season is the killer season. I got to at least get this one in because this is a good one. Amen. It says, it happened one evening. So, I'm sorry. Second Samuel chapter 11, verse 2. I'll let you get to this one. This one's good. Amen. Second Samuel 11 and 2. It says, it happened one evening. <laughs> David arose from his bed and walked to the roof of the king's house. And from the roof, he saw a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful to behold. So David sent and inquired about the woman, and someone said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Well, you know the rest of the story. How many know the rest of the story? The rest of the story is uh, that David calls for Bathsheba. He lays with Bathsheba. Bathsheba gets pregnant, and David uh, sends for her husband, sends her husband to the front line where he knows this guy will be killed and murders her husband. And let me tell you, the problems begin in David's life. This is a bad season in David's life. David murders Uriah, takes his wife. God is displeased with him, and he judges him, and he makes war to rule over David's life. God said, you know, how many know you reap what you sow? You reap what you sow. Matter of fact, it would mock God for me to not reap what I sow. It would be a mockery to God for me to not reap. And so David sows this in his life, and the rest of his life he reaps war. He killed this man in war, and he marries himself to that war for the rest of his life. And it hinders some things down the road. See, what makes a man risk the blessing of God and the love of his family? David was guilty of a lot of things right here. Number one, he's guilty of lust. The definition of lust is to desire something that's harmful to you. That's what lust is. When, when Adam saw the apple, when Eve took the apple and bit it, said, this is good, Adam saw it, it looked good, he wanted something that God said is going to hurt you. When you want things that hurt you, that God knows are destructive to you, it, that falls in the category of lust. And it, it's not just another person, it's an apple, it's whatever. Whatever can harm you, when you want things that harm you, you're lusting after. And so David was guilty of lust, he was guilty of greed, Greed is an unhealthy desire to want more than you can use or more than you need. That's greed. See, he was guilty of selfishness, a devotion to one's self regardless of the effect on others is selfishness. So he's guilty of lust, greed, and selfishness. And why? Why does why, What makes a man overreach? What makes a man do things that cause him to, to cause hurt and loss in his life when he doesn't need it? Uh, no, no matter if this woman was on the roof or whether you're the president of the United States and she's the 21-year-old intern down the hall, what makes a man risk that much? Why would a man risk that much? Why would he, why would he choose that to, to hurt his life? David had entered the most dangerous season in a man's life, and it's the killer season in his life. This is the most dangerous season in a man's life. 
This is the season when a man comes to terms with mortality. I'm going to surprise you what I teach right here, but I want you to listen to it. This is the season that man faces the biggest giant of his life. You know what the biggest giant of a man's life is? Time. Time is what men are afraid of more than anything else. Men are afraid of getting old. Age scares a man. I'm going I'm to explain that in just a little bit more. Time is more frightening than any lion, any bear, or any giant that he's ever been up against because man knows that he can't beat this enemy. He's not going to be able to beat time. During this season of his life, a man becomes a killer. During this season, a man will either kill his dreams or his fear, but something's going to die when he comes to this moment in his life. Listen, I call this the killer season because during this season of a man's life, he's going to kill his dreams or his fear. Some, something's going to die. The killer season of a man's life is, is sometimes what we call a midlife crisis. How many ever heard that term before? Let me, let me explain what a midlife crisis is, and when you hear this definition, you will never forget it. You'll never forget it. A midlife crisis is when a man looks in the mirror and he can picture himself old easier than he can picture himself young. He can't remember what he looks like young anymore, but he can see what he's going to look like old. And it scares a man to death. It frightens a man when he sees that because he knows he can't go back and get that strength. He can't go back and get that. This is, this, this is what I call menopause. When a man goes through this midlife crisis, he gets that fright. He gets that fright that says, I'm not going to be young again. I'm not going to be strong again. And there's that fear that runs through his mind. Have I put enough away? Am I going to be able to take care of my family? Is my health going to hold out for 20 more years? Am I going to be able to handle this? Am I going to be able to carry this? It's scary to a man when he starts going through these things. For centuries, men have crash landed into old age, kicking and screaming, trying to fight it off. But how many know age comes to all of us? Amen? Age comes to all of us. You, you won't always. Man, when I was a young kid working construction, I used to take an 80-pound bag of concrete, store it on my shoulder, and go up a two-story ladder and hand it to a man. If I tried to do that right now, I'd be heaped up on the bottom with concrete all in my hair, and, and they'd say, why'd you try that for, preacher? Because, because I used to be able to do it. Man, I used to throw that concrete on my shoulder and go straight up that ladder like a squirrel. I mean, I, mean, I, I could handle it. I could do it. And I was right there with, with everyone. But, but now you go to pick something up, and you feel it just a little bit. You, you feel it. You, you know, you, David, David didn't need another wife. The Bible said he had five wives that we knew named of. David had at least five wives in the Bible, and any woman he wanted, he didn't need another wife. David didn't need another woman. He needed to know he could still kill the giant. He needed to know he could still get the girl if he wanted to. He needed to know he still had power. He, he didn't know he still had reach. He needed to know he was still important, that he could get somebody's attention. He needed to know people are still looking at me, that, that I still matter somewhere. How many know every once in a while a man gets afraid and thinks he doesn't matter anymore? He thinks he no one sees him anymore. And David wanted to know, if, you know, in, in the old days when I was young, I used to be able to pick out any girl I wanted and she would be mine. Now I'm competing with this guy who gets, who gets people taking pictures of him getting a haircut. I mean, I don't know how to compete with that. What am I going to do? What David, David did, what a lot of men do, he killed his dream by trying to face that moment that he was struggling with. No matter how old a man gets, he always wants to be a giant killer. Come on, somebody. Man, I see my dad right now. My dad's 87. He just had a tumor removed from his colon. He just had knee surgery. I, I talked to him the other day. He said, John, he said, I feel like I'm just working. Like I can't do nothing. Go to do something. I got no strength. I got no power. I said, Dad, you still here? You still walking around? You're 87 years old. 87 years old. And I reminded him. I said, man, you, when your father come to live with us, my grandfather, he, he died when he was 83, and when he came to live with us about 78 or 79, he was in a wheelchair and couldn't walk. And I said, you're doing better than your dad did. I said, every day's a gift. Go ahead and enjoy that day, amen? Come on, help me believe it. Every day's a gift. Go ahead and enjoy that day. When a man enters a killer season in his life, he's, trying, he's attempting to, to go backwards because he wants to be a champion again. Being the old king is not as fun as being the new champion. Can I get an amen?
He misses people cheering his name, being celebrated as a conquering hero. You know, you, you get old, the, you used to drive a cool car, now the cool car in the driveway belongs to your daughter. Amen. Uh, uh, you used, used to have those, those washboard abs, now you got wash tub abs, you know, uh, th things is changing. Now you got more hair on your back than you do on your head, amen? I mean, things is happening, you know, things is happening. And now you hear snap, crackle, pop, it's not your cereal, it's your knees. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, this, this thing's fighting you. This thing's fighting you. are fighting this giant. This thing's fighting you. He feels respected, but he no longer feels celebrated. How many know men need to feel celebrated? Let, let me tell you something, women, let me just help you make your life better. Whether it's your son, your brother, your dad, your husband, man, find a way to celebrate the men in your life. Amen? Find a way to celebrate the. Come on, let's give the men a big hand, everybody. Come on. <laughs> age, age scares a man worse than any other enemy, and I'm going to skip a part here and go right to the last season here, see? During the killer season, a man will kill his fear, his dreams, but if he survives it, he survives it and doesn't kill his dreams, doesn't walk away from God, doesn't leave his family and, and, and walk off into the space somewhere. If God can get a hold of him, just keep him together, get him, get him, get him straightened out and back on the road, he, he goes into the final season. I'll make this short. He goes into the fathering season. I'm not talking about making babies. I'm talking about building people. Amen. I'm not talking about making babies. I'm talking about building people. I'll read this real quick. First Chronicles 28, 1 through 6 says, David now assembled at Jerusalem all the leaders of Israel, the officers of the tribes, the captains, the divisions who served the king, First Chronicles 28 and 1, that served the king, the captains over thousands, the captains over hundreds, the stewards over all the substance, possessions, the kings the, the, uh, of the king and of his sons with the officials, the valiant men and the mighty men of valor. Then King David rose to his feet and said, Hear me, my brethren and my people. I had it in my heart to build a house for the rest of the ark of the covenant of the Lord, for a footstool of our God, and I had made preparations to build it. But God said to me, you shall not build a house for my name because you have been a man of war and you've shed blood. However, the Lord God of Israel chose me above all the house of my father to be the king over Israel forever, for he has chosen Judah to be the ruler of the house of Judah, of the house of my father, and among the sons of my father. And he was pleased with me to make me a king over all Israel. And of my sons, for the Lord has given me many sons, he has chosen my son Solomon to sit on the throne of the kingdom of the Lord. And he said, and it, now he said to me, it is your son Solomon who shall build my house and my courts, for I have chosen him to be his, my son and I will be his father. Listen to this. The, the, the Jews have a, a thing that they do uh, called a bar mitzvah. How many have ever heard of it? They call every important person in their life. Everyone they've ever done business with, every store owner, their lawyer, their doctor, everyone they've done business with, they get them in one room. They put their hand on their son. They say, this is my beloved son in who I'm well pleased. Hear him. You know what he's saying? If he speaks, it's just like me speaking. This is my son. Has, has the father's heart and the father's purpose. You need to hear this teaching on fruitfulness tomorrow night. You have the father's heart and the father. The son is not a baby with boy parts. The son is someone who has the father's heart and purpose. And let me tell you something, women, you can be sons of God the same way men can be the bride of Christ because it's not a gender thing. It's a positioning. It's a spiritual positioning. It's not a gender. It's a spiritual positioning. So David calls all the people together and said, this is Solomon. I couldn't build the house, but I'm, the plans that were in my heart, I'm handing to him because he's going to do what I was not able to do on this earth. I'll say this. There's a whole bunch more I'd like to share with you, but I'll have to do it another time. We'll do a men's conference or something sometime. But here's what I want to say. Children are the Tupperware of our lives. That's what we put our leftovers in. Amen? Come on, somebody. That's what we put our leftovers in. And I don't know about you, but I'm going to have some leftovers. I'm, gonna have, I'm not using it all on this life. I, I'm not. I'm going to have some leftovers. And I'm going to install it in every one of them. The fathering season is about pouring what God poured into you into others. You're not supposed to take it with you. You're not supposed to take your knowledge with you. You're not supposed to take your knowledge of building churches with you. You're supposed to put that in somebody. You're not supposed to take your knowledge of raising a family with you. You're supposed to put that in somebody. You're not supposed to take your knowledge of handling money with you. You're supposed to give that to somebody. 
And if you don't give that to somebody, you haven't fulfilled the fathering season. I'm not talking about biological children. I'm talking about biological children, spiritual sons and daughters, uh, brethren that God connects you to. Anybody God connects you to, they should leave you with a piece of you, with a piece of your heart in them. And so David comes to the place that he's been the shepherd, he's been the champion, he's been famous, he's made bad decisions, and he's been a killer. He's been a king, he's been respected, but now he says, I just want to take what I have and I want to give it away. I want to leave the next generation strong. You know, we don't want our children to start where we started. We want our children to start where we finish. Come on, somebody. I don't want my children to start where I started. I want them to start where I finish. My dad was born in a one-room cabin, no lie, a one-room cabin in, in, in Wingo, Kentucky, a one-room cabin. He had an eighth-grade education when he had to have his mom and dad sign for him to join the Air Force at 17 years old. Just, just barely got an education. We, we all had, we, we all grew up, we got a little more education than he did. My children grew up, they got a little more education than I did. They're all going a little further. But it's only because he poured into me and I pour into my children. How many know God wants you to begin sharing what he's given you? If you know it, you got to share it. Men, if you know it, you've got to share it. You can't keep it. You can't take it to the grave with you. Would you stand with me? Would you stand with me? I apologize if I went too long tonight. I was trying to stuff that in there. Hallelujah. I, I wonder if all the men would just come up just a minute around the altar, all of you men. Hallelujah. All of you men, just come up just a minute. Young and old, boys uh, can come too. Come on, boys, men, children, grown-ups, old, young, doesn't matter. <clears throat> if you fall, the whole family is at risk. You wives and children are at risk if you fall, if you don't make it, if you, if you don't carry the cross, if you don't guard the door. If you don't hold up the sword, the whole family's at risk. They'll only make it if you make it. Man, they're not, the toughest time of my life has been the last three years. I mean, I was sailing, cooking, everything great, doing wonderful. I feel great. I, I went through struggles in my life, but nothing like losing that building, having that building destroyed. Just It, it just devastated me. And I had to come to terms with me and God had to have to talk about some stuff. Because I had some things out of order in my life. Because there's a big part of me that felt like that big, beautiful building was my identity. Yeah. And God stripped all that away. And he said, if it's, if it's become your identity, then you're off course, preacher. He said, I ought to be able to tear it down a time and time again and rebuild whatever I want to. Because if it's become your identity, you're off track. I wrestle with some things, man. It's hard. Because, you know, you go through that thing of, are we going to be able to have a church? Are we going to be able to keep the door open? Can I pay the light bill? And then God sends people like Jerry Hovater that uh, that will bless you with something like he blessed our brother tonight, our pastor friend tonight. And that that's that's like peeling that dead branch of the tree back and seeing a little green. God's still alive. Amen. Come on, everybody. God's still alive. I want to tell you, men, no matter what you're going through, God is still alive. And he don't care if it's the darkest time of your life and you thought, man, I don't know how I'm going to get through this. I don't know how I'm going to pay for it. I don't know how I'm going to get it. God is still alive and he's going to help you. He's going to help you. God is on your side. I would like everybody to just hold your hands towards these men. Men, just reach up put your hand on the shoulders of one of your brethren. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, I ask you to bless these men, young men, old men, men in every season of their life. Some of them are, are doing the worst jobs they ever imagined. God, working for people that are unpleasant, doing jobs that are unpleasant. But that's where they are, and they're pressing through it. Some of these men are at a great place of respect. They've had to learn to measure their words. They've had to learn to be careful what they say around people because they don't want anybody to get hurt. And God, some of these men are pouring out everything that they have. They're in the season of their life where they're just looking for someone to give it to, someone to give their knowledge, someone to tell their story to, someone to give their insight to. But God, more than anything in the world, I want you to encourage these men. And Lord, I want you to let them feel the power of God in their lives. They were designed to carry this cross. 
even when you placed a, a baby in Mary's womb, you spoke to a Joseph because he had to have a man in his life. Didn't need him for the biological contribution, but needed his voice, needed his voice on the earth. Father, in the name of Jesus, these men have sons. Even if their sons are grown, their sons are still. Listen, listen to me, men. Men with grown sons, don't stop speaking. Let me say that again. Men, you're old and you have grown children. Don't stop speaking. They still need your voice. My father is 87. I still need his voice. I still need him to speak to me. Men with young children, and sometimes you don't know how you're going to buy diapers. You don't know how you're going to take care of all the things or something new every day. They come up with you wondering what in the world, what else are they going to put on me? God designed you to carry this cross. And if you'll keep walking for the Lord, God will help you. Father, I ask you to strengthen these men. Lord, I ask you to help all the, the women, the young wives, the mothers, the grandmothers that are standing here today. They have a different walk than these men, and their walk is difficult too, and Lord knows there's a message that's just for them. But if they would take their time to intercede for these men, if they would make sure there's an encouraging word for the men in their house, if they would be the one that prays behind the scenes, if they would be a lifter of the brethren, if they would help these men, their life would be better, their home would be stronger, and more than anything, their children would be stronger. Father, I ask you right now, bless the men of this church. Make them strong, make them able, make them godly. In the name of Jesus, amen. 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 Time, timely. Timely. Be seated just for a brief minute. I got to give our ladies a little time to get your chicken catcher Tory caught. I want you to give large tonight. Amen. And I got our servant leaders to come up. Tommy, I, I don't know who all did. Well, James, thank you. Amen. Everybody give big tonight. You can do it on your phone. Holywild.net slash give. You can give uh, horse cash. Make a check out the little country church. And we'll make sure Pastor Ramsey gets it. But our giving is about honor. Would you agree with me? Amen. It's always about honor. When I give, it's about honor. I'm honoring the one I'm giving to, the one I'm sowing into. I believe in sowing and reaping. And uh, tonight, uh, this is an opportunity to sow into Pastor John. Man, I'm telling you, Rich, it's like we've walked this trail, huh? The seasons. And then I look at Pastor Jason and walk, you know, and, and I looked over and saw Josiah as a young man just getting started and where he's at in the season. But but you, you don't get to... You don't get to cancel a season. You got to go through the season. And, and I'll be honest, sometimes I feel like it's rinse and repeat. I mean, know what I'm talking about. It's like, I've been through that season, but I'm going through it again. It's rinse and repeat. Amen. We thank you for your faithfulness and giving. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight to hear such a powerful word to, to celebrate with Pastor uh, Armando and Pastor Abby. God, what you've done in their lives. We thank you for those who have poured into our lives in this house over and over again. Uh, meet us again tomorrow night. Bless this food tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead, guys. Pass those buckets. Announcements are going to be flashing in front of you. So uh, make sure you see those announcements. You can read as well as I can.